So perfect. Welcome everyone to our last lecture in the reinforcement learning course. Uh, today we're going to only have a lecture, so no exercise today. That's maybe why we also have some extra time in the lecture, or just as a pre-warning. Um, today we are going to discuss, let's say, practical outlooks, basically giving you some insights also into our everyday research work uh, with some challenges on reinforcement learning, which we did not discuss yet on a let's say, more research-oriented level. Uh, that will be safety, safe reinforcement learning, which we did not cover yet. So we will give you a high-level insight on the challenges and one potential uh, solution on safe reinforcement learning in a real-world application. Then we will talk about also the implementation of reinforcement learning for controlling systems which require a fast policy inference. So here we speak about policy inference in the range of Sub milliseconds on the microsecond range. If you need decisions, not you know every minute or every second, but like really ten thousand times a second, uh, how do we do that? Um, and last but not least, we will talk about meta reinforcement learning. So basically, trying to learn not how to manipulate one MDP, but potentially many MDPs, which could be similar but different. Um, I Basically, we'll not do this lecture today. I will just hand over to Daniel and Max today because I'm lazy, so they uh, helped me also out preparing the uh, slides. Uh, after the core lecture, we will have a brief summary about the entire course. There we'll take over again. Um, so what did we learn? Also, what did we not learn? Even although we have an outlook today to also showcase you that this is a basic course uh, and that many interesting challenges and methods and techniques uh, can come uh, after that. And last but not least for today as a third topic, um, or third big bullet point, is that we will have a quick view into the uh, preparation task for the exam, which is uh, available since yesterday. Uh, so we will just briefly go through the Jupyter Notebook and uh, we will give you a short introduction if you have already any questions. We can, of course, address them then during this last part as well. Okay, then, Daniel. Hi, together. I will start today in a second with the first topic, which is called uh, safe reinforcement learning, which is uh, current research like I'm dealing with and yeah. As a little insight to the topic, let's maybe recap a little bit. Since we know now um, after 13, 13 lectures, I think, uh, from now on, if we have a look on the figure down here, that in reinforcement learning, we, we, we learn based on past experience, right? So we experience something and we learn from that. So that, that means that we have somewhere to, to feel the pain before we can learn to avoid it. And um, if you think about a real-world application, that's maybe not the best case. So if you imagine, for example, the lunar lander example, which you were dealing with in an exercise the last or pre last one, I think um, even in the beginning of the learning, if you did it, you saw the lander crashing quite often, right? which in the simulation isn't an issue. But if maybe NASA asks you to land the lander on the moon, I think they wouldn't be quite happy if you just crash it several times to learn not to crash it, right? So um, that could be expensive or even painful if you would sit in that lander. So um, with other words, in real world systems, we would have to care about constraints in the actions and in the state space. And like just uh, highlighted, violating these like, uh, leads to safety issues. We will motivate on the next slide. But um, before that, where this figure actually comes from is out of the first lecture, as you all might remember, correct? Where there were, um, was where Oliver introduced briefly model predictive control and compared it to reinforcement learning, which I just introduced like learning from past data. Compared to this, if we think about model predictive control, like how it was introduced, there we have a model available, and from the current step onwards where we are, we use this model to predict like how the, um, our system would behave in the future and try to optimize a cost function based on that prediction. 
And within this optimization, we can easily, which is scheduled here in 14.1, we can easily take into account the state and action constraints to not like violate and hit a, key, hit a tree while driving a car or crash the lander. And um, yeah, to my mind, like point of current research is bringing these two ideas somewhat together. So we, we see in nowadays a lot of research papers where ML guys uh, dealing with reinforcement learning start to think about like how can we integrate these um, constraints idea from the control part into our artificial intelligence tool. And from the other side, a um, lot of control guys starts to maybe not only predict the future and like forget uh, all about the experience we've done, but maybe use this experience to learn from this and optimize like our control. And um, that's basically what we will try to think about within the next slides. But yeah, to motivate ourselves a little bit, uh, here are some examples sketched for safety relevant constraints, applications and reinforcement or in, in, in general applications we could think about. So we have here a collaborative co uh, robot control task where I think this arm should learn to fulfill some tasks. And to be honest, um, I wouldn't be the guy like when this arm here is controlled without any safety insurance with a reinforcement learning agent, like learning from scratch, right? That could be kind of painful if you have a look where he has the hand next to the saw here, while this guy, this agent tries out some exploration tasks, which could be quite painful. Um, other example here, autonomous car driving. I mean, this kind of self-explaining, right? If an agent learns to, to drive this car on the road. Like just said, we might have to hit a tree if we learn from a past experience, like to figure out that it's not a good idea to hit that tree. Um, medication control, um, this could be, yeah, even painful or quite more than painful if this went wrong somewhat. And an application we are more familiar with since I think most of us are coming from the electrical engineering part is here, for example, an energy system we want to control which is depicted in the figure down here, which is Jaron's home or our micro laboratory um, in, in our lab. So um, we have an emulator sitting there where we can um, build up an energy grid and try out different control tasks. And this is the application we will investigate now on the next slides as well. Um, but before doing so, Let's, let's first think about like, um, what, what safety is and like, what levels we maybe can define. Um, this figure here is derived from a quite nice paper, a review paper about safety and reinforcement learning um, applications. If you're interested in, uh, we can recommend to, to read this. And they will, or like we will do as well, separate the safety levels here in three different sections, which is yeah, to my mind, kind of self-explaining here, but um, yeah, what do we got here? We have like um, an example where obviously a car should drive on the road here through a curve and um, without like leaving the track. And if it leaves the track, we can like maybe label this as some kind of unsafe experience. If you can imagine that there's a tree standing, maybe leave it a little bit, could be not painful, but leave it quite too much, could be painful because you hit the tree. And um, therefore, we can, the lowest level can label here with soft constraints, where we are like indicated here with that arrow, allowed um, to leave our, our state space, like defined down here, just a little bit um, by this um, factor epsilon here indicated. So we have some kind of soft constraints with allowing minimal violation. Uh, the next level would be probabilistic constraint, where like we have no violation with an amount of probability which is labeled here with P. And what we are typically targeting for in really safety relevant real world applications would be the hard constraints task here, um, where we for sure stay inside of our state space for like the whole track we will drive here. Okay, and yeah, with this in mind, we can maybe 
extend our bird's eye perspective on the reinforcement learning application, how we got to know it, um, just a little bit. So, um, in, and this in two ways. First, let's have a look on the left hand side from your side here, where um, we add to our common reinforcement learning framework, where the agent just sends an action um, to the environment which responds with the state. Um, we uh, rate this action with a reward and additionally with some, here it's called safety critic, with some safety indicator, like telling this agent what you're currently doing might become unsafe or is already unsafe, depending on the application, which could be, for example, some kind of punishment term, or you can add some barrier functions where like uh, costs increase or the reward in case like gets quite negative in some regions with a specific gradient to teach the agent somewhat indirectly safety, that it learns to avoid these areas, which to my mind fits a little bit more to this approach here from soft constraint part. And um, yeah, that's the, the, the one idea um, we will um, investigate in a second. The, the other idea is called here uh, the safety shield. So there, uh, this is for me more the direct version of, of safety then. So um, as you see, we alter here the path the, where the agent sends the action to the environment. We are evaluating this action with a so-called shield here. And after the shield, that action is labeled as safe, which is sent to the environment. So we have some kind of tool here which enables us to evaluate if this action for the environment would be okay or not, and then it let it through or alters it in a way. And therefore, of course, it correlates somewhat with knowledge about the environment, and that's where we also uh, already can see this like link of, of this um, standard control approach to the data-driven control approach we, we will see now. Um, yeah, like just said, this stands and falls with like the knowledge of the model or, or the environment I am interacting with. So, um, therefore, here we have provided, derived as well from this uh, publication here, another uh, nice figure where we see here on the x-axis the model knowledge we have, which like here on the left hand side we, we have the highest knowledge and if you go more to the right it's getting more complicated so you, you might have some uh, unknown dominant nonlinear dynamics or it's becoming uh, non -li uh, linear dynamics it's becoming nonlinear or even fully unknown and here on the y-axis you have the safety levels like just introduced so no safety level at all like the soft constraints with a specific probability or like hard constraints. And yeah, let's first have a look at these uh, grayish areas here. So um, if we assume we have like perfect knowledge of our system, we might be able with the classic control approaches, uh, we know like with model based controller to design it for like nearly proven any safety level we want to apply that's possible due to basic lecture. Um, on the other side, we have learned now um, that we can apply reinforcement learning like to any environment and it should be able to interact and control this in, in a way we tell it via the reward. But um, like just said in the beginning, we learned from past data with pure reinforcement learning, we cannot ensure like any safety level uh, from that side. If we want to ensure that uh, safety levels um, we can uh, go one step up with the soft constraints idea to that safety encouraged reinforcement learning, which is here that greenish area, um, which um, is somewhat the idea for me of that safety indicator we've seen on the slide before. Um, if we even want to um, ensure a little bit more safety in case of with a specific probability, we can use the idea here of a safety shield, which is here labeled as static, which means like I have a priori knowledge, I use this knowledge, apply it to my safety shield and then use it. But 
might be that this knowledge is not perfect, and and therefore um, I, I'm like it, it correlates a little bit uh, the safety with like uh, how good I know my system a priori, and therefore we might um, increase this idea even to a learning safety shield, where we can use the data we gather during our reinforcement learning interaction for the general learning to even learn like how the safety shield should look like. So apply some model identification ideas or something and then we can um, even like ensure that um, hard constraints of safety. Yeah, as you see, we have uh, also a big bullet point of uh, nowadays unresolved tasks. So if you're looking for after studies like an idea for a PhD, maybe uh, you can check it out and try to, to fill out some boxes. So uh, today and then the following slides, we will deal with that green and the two pinkish areas here. Okay, yeah, that's basically it uh, as a general introduction to the idea. And now let's go into the application we want to investigate. Um, like already introduced, we will uh, deal with the topic of um, energy power grid. Um, and especially with the uh, microgrid application, since um, we were currently developing this to run in our microgrid emulator. But first, maybe let's have a look about what a microgrid in general is. So, um, microgrid is a local energy grid which consists um, like of different kinds of, of loads. Additionally, we have some components here which is called energy sources which can be from my side on renewables like wind turbine photovoltaics or stuff like that additionally we have a storage system which provides us with a degree of freedom we can maybe use to like use the locally produced energy locally and not feed it into the grid um, or whatever control tasks we want to fulfill and yeah this local grid is then uh, coupled to the public grid here uh, via the point of common coupling and the microgrid in general is defined like to be able to operate connected or uh, standalone from the public grid. And yeah, out of this idea for our investiga investigation now, we will uh, use a very, very simple version of this, which is our uh, application under investigation, which is just a three-phase grid forming inverter, which just so should supply one load. So we just have one source and one load here. And like you see, we have um, in the application here uh, the inverter consisting of that B6 IGBT stack, which is fed here from the DC side, where you could maybe sit a battery um, and uh, photovoltaic storage system, something like that, to uh, feed uh, via this LC filter here. Whatever load sits here with the proper voltage. So that's our task. And that stuff we have modeled in, um, in a gym environment using the OFG tool here, which is a third party tool from a gym, which we have developed a few years ago in, an, in a project at our chair. And we um, the plant you've just seen is now modeled here in that blue shaded area as an average model. Um, so we have like here the easier uh, modeling of that inverter. Here's the filter and, and here's the loads. And uh, our experiment here is running in a continuous state and action space. So therefore we need a reinforcement learning application which can deal with that. And the chosen one is deep deterministic policy gradient agent which we have got to know a few lectures ago. And um, yeah, this tool then provides the gym interface for common reinforcement learning libraries. So basically here we've just used uh, the stable baseline three versions. You have also used like in lecture uh, to like uh, train the agent to supply this load here. And the load acts as a stochastic disturbance to this control task. And um, yeah, to fulfill this, the agent gets as a state, like seen here, the measured current and the measured voltages here, as well as the reference point. And the action it provides to the environment is like labeled here, 
can be interpreted as a modulation index somewhat because it's multiplied with the deceiling voltage in that average model um, to evoke here the plant with a proper voltage to fulfill this control task. Um, the reward is designed as a function of the measured state uh, quantities here, voltage and current, and the reference voltage we will investigate on the next slide. It is designed to be in the range of uh, 1 till minus 0 0.75. And additionally, we have like um, spent a safety indicator to the agent, which is a punishment term in the case of the current or the, uh, so the inductor or the voltage of the capacitor here exceeds a predefined limit. So in that case, um, we give, in, instead of the reward, a minus one in the reward as a punishment term um, to the agent that it learns not to crash these limits and with the idea of the safety indicator. That's the first type of agent we will see uh, in, the, in the next slides. Um, but maybe first, since the reward design from an engineering perspective is our degree of freedom to like, tell the agent which control task it should do, let's, let's check it out briefly uh, how it's done here. Basically, the reward here is separated in three different areas. And um, in, in this figure here on the left, we see two of these areas, the, uh, um, especially area A and area C. The first area is the mean root error between the measured voltage and the reference voltage. And um, if we see that we, some kind, we want to have 0 0.2 normalized by the limit um, of the reference voltage, um, we, uh, and we, we, we hit this voltage, we give like a plus one to the agent. And if we deviate from our reference, we fall based on the root mean error between the two. Um, uh, dependent on how much we deviate from that. So area A is somewhat the rooftop of this curve here. And um, if we like leave the valid state space, so if like our voltage here, for example, is higher than one, remember it's normalized by the limit, so higher than one means we crash the limits, it's even higher. Um, this is then our area C, which is that safety indicator punishment term on this side or on this side, where we give a minus one back, like to teach the agent, don't go there with some kind of safety gap, that's bad. Area B, we do not see uh, since uh, during plotting this, I had a lag in the, in the fourth dimension, but um, it's, it's just an adding, um, yeah can interpret it as a punishment term as well, like if we increase the nominal current um, but are still below the limit current, uh, we reduce our reward a little bit to tell the agent to stay within uh, or below our nominal current because that's typically how the inverter is designed. Okay, um, like ever and as well in the last uh, lecture I had the honor to give, uh, if you have questions, just interrupt me and scream, right? Okay. Um, cool. Yeah, since we now have seen what's in this reward and in the safety indicator, um, let's think about how we can implement for our application the other idea of, of safety. Uh, we have um, introduced a, a few slides back, which was called the safety shield here. And if we think about this, how it was introduced, like there is that the safety shield should ensure that actions um, where the does, uh, does not cause any state limit violations in the future system trajectory for the current state I am in. So um, I am in a state and I have to ensure by drawing this action that I stay safe from there onwards. And if that is the case, I will call this state action pair feasible. And all of these state action pairs, which can be labeled as safe or feasible, we can combine in a set, which is called the feasible set, which is in this figure here marked in the greenish area. And um, yeah. Maybe let's have a look in this example here. So what do we see? We have on the x-y plane our state domain, so our 
voltage and our current. And for the current state we are here, the agent currently chooses this red action here, which is out of the feasible set and therefore labeled as unsafe. If we take a look at it where it is, we can see that it's at a quite high current here. And um, meaning that we, if we would apply this action, so such a high voltage to our plant here uh, on the left hand side, that we would leave the feasible, uh, the, the feasible region and this would lead to an overcurrent within the next step inside of my inductor. So therefore, I cannot choose such a high action and uh, the safety shield does uh, alters this action in a way that it's shifting down this action into my greenish area and reduce it as that much that, I'm, that I can avoid the uh, overcurrent here in the inductor and therefore stay safe. But like to do so, we of course, or to calculate this feasible set, we need some knowledge about how our system would react on this action, like to, to, to do this, some kind of prediction here. Um, and therefore, yeah, we on the one hand have maybe a perfect a priori model available, or we can apply some model identification during runtime to identify our model we require to calculate this feasible set here. And that's what we done, at least both, uh, in the following one. In our case, we have replied recursively square to identify the model. Mm. For me, at the moment, it's enough if you have understood the idea like, okay, this I can calculate based on my model. And that's unsafe because I run out of here the y-axis. And that's safe because I stay in, inside my feasible region. If you want to learn more about this, uh, I think Oliver has a, a full lecture about, or at least a half lecture, fully about how this is calculated. So basically this comes from like the, the control engineering part, as I introduced in the beginning, we nowadays try to fuse machine learning and control and take like the advantage. If we have knowledge, let's, let's use it, don't be stupid. Um, so um, yeah, if, if you're interested in this, uh, I think next semester you won't hold it, right? Probably. But uh, hopefully there's a lecture for control where you can figure out how this is calculated. Questions to this concept at all? Because it's quite quick, but not quite much on one slide. But if you got the idea, that's sufficient for now. Okay. Um, if you have listened, I introduced that we will investigate three different types of agent in the following. So the, the one with the safety, yes? Yes, here and here, so the XY plane, yes. Indeed, a good question. Do you have plans for after, like when you <laughs> left the course? Um, good one. Uh, yeah, that's not an easy one. And of course, you have to deal with this. Like you were saying, if we don't draw a point which could be shifted into this region, but which is maybe here, right? Which could happen on because we suck or uh, like because we have maybe measurement noise um, and which shifts at this point out of the region. Yeah, uh, then you have to come up with a strategy what you do then. So uh, what I did uh, indeed is to apply soft constraints in this case, um, where I allowed to, if we think about that ge geometrically, to, to extend my greenish area a little bit. With, but the, this I, I punish in, in an optimization with very high costs that the, uh, the optimizer in this case, which sits here in the safety shield for shifting down this action doesn't really not want to do it and only does this if it's like not possible to go somewhere else because I think if, if I extend this just a little bit into this direction it's maybe better to, to even shift the action if I'm already out of the state space even down instead of like choosing a fully random action. Somewhat clear? 
soft constraints would be the label you have to look for. Clear or just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but very good question. Other can, question? And you can just be unlucky and start in a position where everything is working already. <laughs> yeah. In that case, no controller can do anything. If you die in the beginning, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, I, de I described three different types of agents we will investigate, right? So the one with the safety indicator, which just learns from, from the punishment. Then we have one uh, where, which maybe has perfect knowledge about our system and one where we want to identify, which are basically somewhat these different regions here, the three. Um, so, yeah, that's what we have investigated with this application here as a proof of concept and simulation. And yeah, basically the first one, which was the, I think the greenish area uh, in, in the diagram, um, is here labeled in blue, which is a DDPG agent, <laughs> um, which uh, has no safety shield, but learns from this safety indicator of the punishment term. And what we see here is, yeah, some kind of, uh, yeah, not really learning curve, but we have the learning steps here on the x axis. And on the y axis, we have the accumulated unsafe events in case of, do I have an overcurrent or an overvoltage in my simulation setup? So, uh, how often did my done flag returns true in this case? No, it doesn't mean like my lab explodes, but in a real world application, maybe that would. So, um, as you see here, that blue curve, which is, since this is, are the accumulated events, this is somewhat continuously increasing, even in the end here of the uh, 150,000 learning steps, we can see that the agent with that safety indicator has maybe in the end somewhat learned to avoid these, uh, uh, to, to avoid these overcurrent and voltage events. And if we long for, uh, learn further, uh, he, he might be fully able to, but of course, if we would apply this now in, in the lab, uh, like 150,000 times uh, new capacitors wouldn't be a good idea, I think, right? Okay. Only the few we had to exchange were painful enough. Um, yeah, so um, that's why let's investigate the red agent we see here, which is an agent which has perfect a priori knowledge. And since this is a simulation, we can just, or we've just used the simulation setting, so the parameters for inductor and capacitor, and applied this to the model we have used to calculate the feasible set. And then in that case, we perfectly know our system if we do not apply some measurement. Of course, this acts as a proof of concept because in a real world system, that's not possible. But as a proof of concept, we can see that no overcurrent and voltage events occurred here during the learning, even in the beginning when the agent was totally stupid. So we can say that this tool, which we've just introduced and motivated, can help us if we would have perfect knowledge to ensure really that highest level hard constraint safety. And yeah, of course, in a real world application, that might not be possible. Or maybe if you think about the load would be part of your model in that safeguard, depending on which measurements you have available in your filter. Um, like, uh, and, and that load acts as a disturbance and is changing, uh, or your model changes. Uh, you might not have a perfect a priori knowledge, and you have to identify what's going on in the environment you're controlling. And that's what's showing here the green curve, where we have uh, used uh, recursively square to identify a linear system for our model. And this model in the beginning has been fully randomly initialized, which might not be the best choice, but uh, in any way, uh, we see here that even in this case, after around about 100 steps, we have identified and calculated our feasible set good enough to like from there on and ensure safety. And we're currently working on to reduce this curve here to the green to the, to the red one. Um, but yeah, that's like depends on the complexity of your application, of course. 
And we could show as well, which is not uh, shown here on the slide, but that this prevention of termination events of the environment even improves the learning behavior. If you plot the reward curves, for example, that you, you can see that the red guy or the green guy uh, learned much faster in comparison to the blue guy. And if you're interested in that, you can find the results in the paper we've just uh, <laughs> published on a conference a few weeks back. So this is quite up to date, at least for me, research. <laughs> and um, yeah, maybe as the last slide, not to, to talking and showing about learning curves, but we, we can see here uh, for the RLS agent, which is um, here applied to a deterministic application, so no action noise. Um, to, to a test case that we uh, can supply somewhat a nice voltage to our load, which is even altered here based on a random process. And even in case of load jumps or stuff like that, no uh, un unsafe events occur and the voltage looks quite nice. Yeah, and I think that's it from my part regard to safety. Yeah. Yes. Yes, somewhat. We are, we are just building this this up, uh, Jeremy and me together in the lab currently. To, to figure out if, if this holds true e even on a real application, which the linear model from, from our side is just an assumption. Yeah, but yes. Correct, thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Then we have a very interesting following up topic by Max. Thanks. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, and the same applies here. If you find something interesting, uh, please just ask right away. Maybe it is interesting to me as well. Um, real world implementation with fast policy inference. Um, then you already said um, that at some point we want to move away from the simulation and learn from real world experience. Um, and in that case, we get kind of a problem because um, that means that we also need to make all the computations that are um, accounted for or that, that we need for that, um, that we also need to make them with uh, reality um, and maybe real-time constraints. This applies most of all for the acting part of our reinforcement learning agent. So if we have like here an actor critic um, agent like in DDPG or classical actor critic, we only need um, the actor to be available in real time, or only, only this part uh, to be available in real time. But yet still, we also need to perform the um, calculation of the update. Uh, so the critic, the actor learning, um, the gradients. All this has to happen somewhere. And usually, we don't want this to happen on control infrastructure, because our control infrastructure we usually utilize to full extent or what we are trying to do um, in terms of safety, for example. Um, so we do not really have the um, availability of any more um, capacity on that. And therefore, it is of interest to look at um, possible ways to outsource the learning part away from our test bench, away from our application. We don't want to have it at the same place. And actually, you don't need the, um, yeah, Need to, you don't need to have the um, calculation hardware uh, once the training is finished. That's the other point, right? You only need that during one uh, training phase. Um, and if you decide to not train any further after that, then um, the hardware would be um, not necessary at your application anyway. So therefore, there's, uh, there are several benefits of outsourcing the learning part away from your application. And then on the other hand, you need to make up your mind what to do about the, um, yeah, application relevant part, because this needs to be available in real time. And real time can be different 
um, according to what your ap actual application is in the end. If you have a mechanical system, they behave rather slowly, uh, they have inertia, um, and therefore you usually have a little bit more time to calculate your next action. But the more you get into electric systems, um, the, slow, uh, the uh, faster you need to sample and the faster you need to be um, with your um, decision making and the faster you need to have your next action uh, ready. Therefore, you need to consider um, using different uh, kinds of hardware in order to have that accelerated, to have the calculation fast enough. CPU would, of course, be the go-to variant. So if this is fast enough, you can just do everything on a CPU. You just program it in your uh, yeah, programming language of choice, and the CPU will be available or can then just perform every command sequentially. If you have multiple um, CPUs, then, of course, you can benefit from that a little bit. But in general, the CPU will just perform sections um, uh, um, Sequentially, a GPU, probably um, know from the big papers on, on um, artificial intelligence, where there's a lot of, huge lot of data to be um, used uh, for training, for example. Um, so we can benefit from GPUs on the training side, but not so much actually on the application side. And FPGA is something um, maybe, or uh, expectedly most of you have heard from, um, I will come to that in a minute on a, uh, uh, on a different slide. <clears throat> okay. So, what, is the, what, what are the uh, limitations of that? Um, as I already said, in uh, real-world applications, we have a real-time control interval with real-time constraints, so to say. We have time from uh, sampling k to k plus 1, so one sampling instant, um, which is available for us to calculate our next decision. We don't have more than that. After that time, the decision must stand. Otherwise, um, we maybe fail to um, save uh, yeah, our system. Maybe we, um, if we ca cannot come up with the next decision in time, maybe everything is lost already. So if you want to uh, consider safeguarding as well, uh, then you have to be even faster than that because the safeguard also needs some time to calculate. <clears throat> For the training part, however, this is not really an issue, right? The training can be slower. If we have safeguarding, um, like uh, Daniel um, proposed, um, already in place, um, then we do not really make, uh, need to make up our mind whether our uh, plant is, is uh, safe in, in that sense that it won't damage itself. And therefore, the training can take longer. Of course, it should not take longer than necessary. We want to have it as fast as possible anyways. Um, but um, we are allowed to, to have it slower than the um, control time. And therefore, yeah, doing the training step can, can take up several uh, steps in the real world, actually. This is not an issue. Um, and then we are updating the um, actual application, so the, the agent that is actually uh, in use. Uh, we are updating while it is still in use. So. Um, we are uh, changing the parameters of that on the fly. And maybe one would expect that this is a disturbance of the process while the process is running, um, right? Parame changing parameters on a, on a running system is not always um, free of, of doubt. But in our case, usually learning rates are not so large, right? So parameters will not um, change so fastly. And therefore, the disturbance that you are inducing that way is also not that, uh, not that critical. Um, usually, as it says here, the um, weights are um, changing rather smoothly and therefore changing them in an online fashion is not really safety uh, critical. And actually, if you have the safety um, uh, taken care of in some other fashion, then this is not an issue anyways. So, why is that important for us? I am looking at um, controlling electric uh, motors. And in electric motors, you have sampling times of microseconds. In this case, 50 microseconds, sometimes up to 100 microseconds, maybe even a little bit more. But um, anyways, pretty fast. So I have to be done with calculating my next action in 50 microseconds. Um, in this case, for this algorithm, I use the DeepQ network, so DeepQ learning which we have studied here also in this lecture. So for you, this is no, no surprise, nothing magical in here. 
And um, I, I named this algorithm Deep Q Direct Torque Control, which is also here in the title, Deep Q Direct Torque Control. But in essence, this is only a Deep, deep Q network. Um, and now I have the problem that I need to be able to calculate the output of this Deep Q network in 50 microseconds. As I said, I can outsource the learning to somewhere else. The learning can be slower. But the inference, so asking the neural network, what should I do? This needs to be very fast. And 50 microseconds is not actually so much time if you think about it. Especially not if the network that you're using here grows in size. And uh, in this case, sadly it did. Uh, it's a 10 layer network with 90 um, neurons in each layer. So 90 by 90 um, matrices uh, that you want to uh, multiply with each other. And doing this in this amount of time is not really that easy. So you have large matrices that need to be um, uh, computed and um, multiplied with each other, uh, which is not, uh, yeah, not an easy task, actually. <clears throat> and on top of that, we have the measures of safeguarding and we have the measures of uh, recursively scarce identification that also need to fit into this time of 50 microseconds. So we do not even have 50 microseconds to do our um, inference of the agent. We, even, uh, we actually even have less because we also need to spare some time for the other uh, tasks that need to be performed here. Darren? Uh, maybe could be, yes. But um, you need to consider that in um, drive systems, you also have a change of the reference um, uh, of, the, of the frequency, right? The frequency is the um, speed of the motor. And um, if that changes, then also your parameters change rather rapidly. And then maybe it, it may be too slow to have that outsourced to some other device. Yes, of course, but how do you get information into that lookup table, right? You also need to fill up this information somehow, and uh, so therefore you need to have some, some idea of identification, some measure that identifies the system. And also your system can be, cha can be changing in behavior at runtime uh, apart from that, right? Uh, not not uh, only um, in terms of things that you can measure, because in our case, for example, the speed is very critical, Critically, but we also measure it. So this is something that we know of if it changes. But for example, the temperature is a little bit more tricky. You don't really, oftentimes you don't really me measure the temperature in such a device and therefore changing and adapting to that is not that easy therefore um, because you don't know what the temperature is. Um, but if you identify what the outcome of the temperature change is in terms of electric behavior, then you also don't need to care about it. So this is a idea. So the learning, as I already said, uh, of this DQN can be outsourced to somewhere else. In this case, um, we had it um, yeah, uh, put up in an edge computing style. So we have a server, um, a really good performing hardware uh, set up somewhere else, um, with, where we just can send our experience data, whatever we measure from the test bench, we just send it there. This is this set epsilon here, and then the learning steps, the training steps happen there. We get uh, back some information on what the new um, agent's weights should be. And this is then set back to the test bench here, parameter theta. And this we can then just apply in our process. So asynchronous, as uh, it says here, as this process does not need to be performed in real time and not, um, yeah, not, not in any, any um, relation to the real-time task. However, here we have embedded hardware. This needs to be performed in real time. So here we have the hard constraint of having everything done in 50 microseconds. And if you're interested in that, there's a paper you can read up on uh, to see how it was done. This is actually a link. You can just click it and get sent there right away. Um, OK, jokes aside, I, I said that. Um, I will be uh, telling you also what the FPGA um, will do in this, um, <laughs> in this uh, process or procedure. As I already teased, if you are using a CPU, then in general, all the commands have to be done sequentially. 
every neuron uh, that we have to um, evaluate actually has the same job. We have some input vector to the neuron, we have some weighting vector in the neuron, we have some bias. Everything is calculated, so this is the linear part, and then we have some activation function, and out comes the output of the neuron, just one neuron in this case. So this is a scalar, and um, many neurons then make a vector just like this one, and then we can send this to the next layer. And if we do this in a CPU kind of style, then we have this setup that we see up here. So we start with the first neuron, do this calculation, then we get to the second neuron, we do this calculation. It all can take very long, actually. If your matrices are large, then you don't really want to do this. Large matrices means many neurons, and many neurons need, means you have many blocks next to each other in here. If you then also have many layers in there, then the task just takes exponentially longer. And in some uh, situations, you just don't have the time to do that. <clears throat> so therefore, we consider doing the same thing with an FPGA. In an FPGA, things are not necessarily done in sequential, but maybe even in parallel style. And in this case, the task is actually very easily parallelizable, because what every neuron does is the same. So if I know how this can be done easy or, or in the fast way, then I can just copy that and say, like, I have this, this process performed now 90 times or whatever my neuron count is, and I want to have this done at the same time for all the neurons that, that I have. It's a little bit more complicated to program that, because you cannot use high-level programming languages like Python or C++ that easily for that. Um, you have to make up your mind a little bit around that because you're actually designing hardware in this case. You're telling hardware how it needs to be arranged in order to have this process performed as fast as possible. But if you can do that, um, then, yeah, uh, you see that, that everything uh, aligns really nicely in the end because neurons are um, evaluated at the same time for one layer. And the same hardware that is used for the first layer can then be used for the second layer. Um, because the process, the, the, the calculation that I need to make is actually the same, right? Just have to um, change out the weights that I'm applying, but not the, not the uh, calculation step. Of course, there are some limits to that. I wrote here there the maximum number of parallel com uh, computations, with, which is limited by the size of the FPGA. As I already said, you are designing hardware in there. Um, and you only have a limited, um, yeah, lim limit, uh, an upper limit to the hardware that the FPGA can use. So the, the FPGA is limited in size, and this kind of puts a limit to the number of neurons that you can evaluate at the same time, so in that dimension. And of course, the number of layers that you are evaluating is still kind of correlated to the time that you will be taking. You will be saving time uh, no matter what if you're going from CPU to FPGA, but um, yeah, as you can see, you still need more time if you want to evaluate more layers. So, putting it all together, we arrive at this architecture. We have our replica control prototyping hardware, so which is basically the hardware which is performed in real time. Um, a DSpace micro lab box system, um, and in there we have an FPGA from Xilinx um, that is then able to perform this fast network inference. We have a test bench computer which is for monitoring most of the time, so I can see what is measured, but actually it's not directly um, uh, needed in order to control the um, control plant. But in our case, we can just take the measurements that uh, arrive here anyways, send them to the workstation, perform the learning step, and send back the new network weights to this PC and then over to the micro lab box. And from here, we are taking direct action onto the uh, control system, so the um, motor system, permanent magnet synchronous machine that we see down here. And it works. Um, Exactly. The communication is based on uh, TCP IP networking protocol, so you need to make up your mind how you send back and forth the, uh, the weights. You need to have some um, interface for that, of course, um, which uh, was necessary to be programmed at first. And um, what is also a big plus is 
the backward path. So whatever happens on the workstation, actually a generic step. The workstation does not care if the data is coming from an electric grid, if it is coming from a motor, or if it, if it is coming from our lunar lander. It can be anything, right? The learning is uh, working out the same way. Um, and therefore, we do not have so much adaptation effort in the workstation if we want to change our system. Of course, we have to tell it, okay, the state space has so many entries and the action space has so many entries. But that's actually it. You don't need to tell the workstation, okay, the motor that we will be using today um, has this and these or that specification. It doesn't care about that. So changing the motor would be very easy uh, in terms of the workstation here. So this one does not really know this one only knows the data that is coming from there. And now that I told you that it actually works, I also want to prove to you that it actually works. No? <clears throat> so, picture this scenario. It's Monday morning in the winter, 7 o'clock a.m. You're supposed to design the drive controller and the coffee is not ready yet. So it's already a lost battle, if you ask me. But um, we decided to have um, our reinforcement learning drive controller race against the coffee machine to see which one of those will be done faster with, it, with its task. So there we have the learning button. And if we start now, then we see or the, the important part is we give it a learning time of only five minutes. So five minutes real world time that we are collecting data from the test bench. And yeah, if you, are no, uh, if you, if you know uh, about drives, then you can make sense of all of these plots. But I think in this, um, um, in, in the, the, the sense uh, we are here for today, only this plot is most important. I hope every one of you can see it. Um, it says uh, torque in Newton meters. So it's a, the torque that we are measuring from the test bench or the force, if you want so. And we have in red, the value that we want to get, the reference value of the torque, and in green, the value that we are measuring from the test bench. So the task is the green plot, uh, the green line must be on the red line. The red line is the given reference, and the green line must be moved into that direction. And we give it five minutes. And we also give the coffee machine only five minutes. It must be done in that time. So let's see what happens. At this point, we accelerate the video a little bit so that it's uh, easier to look at. The coffee machine is already starting, but here we see a lot of noise actually, right? The green uh, line is not, not really doing so much uh, in the sense of, of what it's supposed to uh, in the beginning due to exploration noise, of course, but now the further we get to the end, the better we get in terms of torque control. And you see that here um, after five minutes or not even, we have seven more seconds to learn. <laughs> Um, the torque control is actually working out pretty nicely. Of course, there are some regions, you see that over here, where the green line is not on top of the red line, but you also need to consider that there are constraints, uh, constraints um, that are um, enforced by physics, right? If we do not have the voltage available, and this is uh, for this uh, operating point uh, the case, we do not have the voltage available at our test bench in order to have this uh, operating point, then of course no controller in the world uh, could do it. So therefore, um, it's uh, yeah, it may be allowed <laughs> in this case. Yeah, and now this is only after five minutes. Imagine what happens after ten minutes or after fifteen minutes. Can only get even better, even more awesome. <clears throat> okay. And I think this is already the last slide in this um, section. So any questions concerning this?
I know it's very overwhelming. It was also for me. So let's just go on with um, the last section for today, which is uh, Jaren. Um, not yet, but the expectation is actually that you should be able to beat model predictive control or any other model-based controller because usual, um, or for taking model predictive control as an example, you don't, uh, you are not able to perform so many prediction steps in the amount of time that is given. Like, also model predictive control has the same constraint of being done in 50 microseconds or 100 microseconds or whatsoever. Um, and the number of prediction steps that you, that you can do in this time is just limited. Um, this is not a problem for reinforcement learning, though, because this one will learn from experience and will learn on an infinite time horizon. You can just um, change that by changing the discount factor, um, but changing the discount factor does not really change the computational effort that you have in that, all that process. And actually, it's only um, needed um, in the back end, so in the, in the um, um, workstation. So the part that is not real-time dependent. So the expectation would be that this one can beat model predictive control because model predictive control has a more limited time horizon to consider. And actually, um, yeah, model predictive control, or the, the model that we identified here is only a linear model as well. And therefore, model predictive control also could only um, figure out how to um, behave in terms of the linear behavior of, of what we identified. And the reinforcement learning agent would not be limited to the linear behavior. The safeguarding is limited to the linear behavior, but the, the action that the um, actual agent is um, selecting is not limited to the linear behavior. So good question. Um, so the short answer is no. I have, have no um, uh, comparison yet, but I would expect this one to be better than model predictive control if done correctly. Further questions? None, okay. Then let's have a short look at the last point of meta-reinforcement learning also. Um, picture this. Your, your, your agent or your, yourself are acting upon some environment and you know that there is a class of environments that is similar. I hope you see that these, uh, all of these uh, mazes have a different color. I think it's not that clear here now uh, that I look at it uh, on the slide. But um, if you look at it on your computer, uh, then, then you will see all of these mazes have a different color. So we have environments that are somewhat similar, but also somewhat different in some critical aspects. So whatever we learn from one of these environments, we can maybe, hopefully, transfer also to the other environments but not all of what we've learned, because they will behave not the same. They will behave similar, but not the same, not identically. So how can we picture this in terms of reinforcement learning? Um, in the beginning of the course, uh, we've uh, talked about Markov decision processes, but there are also these um, uh, partially observable Markov decision processes where some of the information about the environment are not available to us from a measurement. You can picture it as something like that. So you have an environment, but you don't see all of the environment that is uh, interesting to you. You only see parts of it. <clears throat> and therefore, also, your observation is, as you can see here, um, it's dependent, uh, or yeah, the, the output of your um, system is, so Y is uh, dependent on, on your state of the system, but you don't know all the state of the system. So you also don't, um, you cannot make direct sense um, of, of the uh, system output in terms of which environment you are dealing with now. But still, the, the idea, the concept is interesting. Um, save up on learning time when you transfer your agent, transfer your knowledge from one environment to another, when you already know that these will be similar in some fashion. There are several approaches to do that. The usual experience is that the information that allows us to distinguish one environment from another is available from a larger set of observations. So if I have large history of observations, um, 
if I measure for a long time, then I usually can um, get out the information about the kind of environment from that. This is kind of the same idea as in system identification. I have th some, some system model and I try to tune that system model according to what my um, system has done in the past, what I've been measuring for a longer time. So I try to make use of this experience that um, is kind of natural uh, in, in control theory um, in terms of reinforcement learning as well. And there are several yeah, ways to do that. We could use recurrent networks. So this one is just a policy network. So pi is our policy. Um, we just get the observations uh, and put them into that uh, network. But now you see we have some recurrent arrows in here. So we can remember um, the, the observations that we've made in the past. And in this way, somehow, maybe <coughs> our network could also learn to adapt to that. So if we are switching, from one environment to another environment, and they will be behaving um, similar in some sense, then this recurrence, these, uh, these backwards errors, arrows, could allow us to um, also adapt to this kind of environment. So taking some knowledge that we've gained on environment A also to environment B. Another idea could be the use of so-called context networks. You see, we just put in a larger a larger database of uh, observations that we've made into this network. So several, not only one, but several state transitions um, are stored in there. And then we get out some so-called context vector, which is called Z here. And this context vector then tells us with, with what environment we are dealing with. We feed this into our policy, and in this way our policy also has a sense of what environment it is dealing with. And this can be interesting in that sense, as I said in the previous example, um, mechanical systems behave differently than electrical systems in terms of, of reaction time, but also electrical systems uh, behave differently in terms of reaction time um, with each other. So if you have a larger motor, it will behave differently than a, a smaller motor. Um, and, and this could be encoded somehow in this context vector Z, and therefore you can act accordingly to that. The problem with that is you really cannot interpret what is in this vector. So it's not, not uh, some information that is, uh, makes sense on a physical level. Don't really know is that somehow connected to what the system is, be, um, uh, is parameterized like, or at least not in what sense. Um, but it is some information about the system, and at least the reinforcement learning agent can make use of that information. Or the last and actually simplest idea would be to use expert knowledge. If I already know which parameters my system would have, then I can just feed them directly into this um, uh, actor in, or into my policy, and then my policy will know, okay, um, this, today I'm dealing with this kind of system, so I have to do this or that in order to stabilize it or uh, um, minimize the, the error or whatsoever. So these are the different concepts that you could, um, uh, that you could use for that. So now let's look at our, uh, our specific problem, what, uh, what we are investigating. <clears throat> um, if you want to do drive control or any other type of control, you have an agent, you have a system, the agent is trained, and then you have a closed loop control system that you can apply. And then you do that another one, and another one. And every, every training, Every application uh, or every, every step to application will take you the same time as the last one. And this is actually not economical thinking, right? Because if this system is mostly the same as this system, it only changes in terms of some parameters, then I can take some knowledge from here also to this scenario, and then maybe I do not need so much time to train anymore because I already have that experience. So therefore, we thought about also training one of those meta-learning agents on several motors. You see, this one was blind on one eye because it only has seen one motor. This one uh, can see clearly on both eyes. Uh, train this, on a large, uh, this agent on a larger set of motors um, in, in the best case of all power classes so that in the end we have a meta-learning agent that is uh, available to control not only the motors it has seen, but also some new motors that it has not seen in the training. Because neural networks 
are very good at interpolating, right? So if we have low power class and high power class motors, we should be able to interpolate in between that and also um, control intermediate power class levels. On the other hand, if you do not respect uh, or do not pay attention to that, um, you might get problems because neural networks are not so good at extrapolating. If you only have lower class, uh, lower, lower power class um, motors in this set, but you want to control high power class motors here, you might get a problem. Extrapolation is not a strength of neural networks usually. Um, but if you pay attention to that, then this actually works out. And we did this using a, so, uh, the, the um, uh, context network approach that I, that I already showed. We fill a so-called commissioning buffer with some data about the motor. We do this in beforehand just to have some data available on how the motor will behave. We throw this into the context network and then get this context vector out here. And this will describe how the motor will behave. And then we can just use it for different kinds of motors. As you can see, we have environment one, two, three, four. I think in the end, end we had 150. Not in our lab, of course, but in simulation. Our lab would not be uh, big enough for that. <clears throat> and um, Darius and me, we wrote a paper about this um, that you can find here, um, where everything is explained in detail. And the outcome of that um, idea was that in the end, um, yeah, we actually made it work. So on the left, you see a motor of lower power class. You see, um, or pay attention to the uh, currents that are um, available here. So here we have 4.2 amp, uh, amps and here 420. So it's a, it's a huge difference uh, in terms of the power level. But the um, reference trajectory is the same. And you see that actually the kind of perf the performance is also um, sufficient. It's, it's not great. And it's also different between those two, but it can follow this reference trajectory in some to some degree. And uh, of course, this is something to build up, uh, yeah, to, to uh, build up upon. Of course, there's still something to uh, improve. You see that here we are not actually hitting the reference, but we are stopping before that. But in general, <clears throat> it is doing what it is supposed to do. Questions to that part? Okay. Oh, Oliver, do you want to have that last slide? Uh, I think we have more time already. Hmm? Okay. Whatever you want. Thanks, Max. Okay, so um, that was basically a little bit of actual research. Um, Hmm? Yeah, that was the kindergarten group today, which could present. Um, so a little bit of research excursion, so to speak. Um, I just need to quickly compile another slide set. That's all live cooking. Uh, any questions in between? Yeah, that's... As I said, it's live. <laughs> if you're interested in any of those topics, then you just talk to us um, and we will find something for you. There we go. Right. So, um, we have now really come to an end of the entire course today, uh, for obvious reasons, because that's the, the last lecture uh, week uh, here at the university. So uh, I thought it would be a good idea to have like a little bit of a summary of what we actually did so far to see also like what route we did go together. Uh, so what you should know also, especially with respect to an exam um, and things you might want to look in yourself in the future. So basically uh, what we have looked at is basically a lot of this uh, map let's say, of reinforcement learning-based methods, which we first looked into on tabular approaches, so where the uh, state and action spaces had been discrete and where we could have uh, obtained exact solution due to the uh, sake of the policy uh, improvement theorem. And we did also the same now in the second part of the entire course with function approximators to extend to the continuous state and actions. And if 
by chance and an exarm, there could be questions to uh, what is uh, a policy-based method. So in this case, you should be able to tell us something about policy gradients, for example, right? Or what is a value-based policy or value-based reinforcement learning solution where you could, for example, talk about Q learning, right? So where we directly try to learn about the optimal Q values of some actions and then try, trying to pick the action which is most appropriate. We also discussed about things which are intermediate solutions like actor critic, where we have some part estimating the Q value, some part making the policy decisions. And also, especially today, we also discussed a lot about basically this axis, the model based and model free parts. Uh, basically, we have mostly dealt, of course, with model free solutions, but we have also seen that from a practical engineering point of view, where we um, operate in real world systems, that normally model free approaches are um, too prone to errors, pr too prone to safety related issues, especially during early exploration. And that from an engineering point of view, we normally always need some model-based or expert-based knowledge in order to safeguard things, to um, improve the exploration and so on. So therefore, um, our main message here in this entire course is that reinforcement learning can be an interesting part of the solution when it comes to controlling, manipulating complex technical systems, dynamical systems. Uh, however, especially for real-world engineering problems, as we are all here like engineers, uh, we need to combine it with something which is model-based, which is expert-based. Max and Daniel have shown us some interesting approach to that today. And therefore, our uh, sincere recommendation is to combine the, the inputs which you have obtained in this course with knowledge from control engineering. Of course, that's basically the same objective. We want to control, we want to manipulate a dynamical technical system. In control, classical control engineering, we do this with basically expert rules, with model-based rules, and here in reinforcement learning, we have done this basically model-free, data-driven, and uh, we think that combining the two things together into a model-based plus model-free approach, so data-driven and expert-driven approach, can be very nice, and that's actually part of the research going on right there in the field. So therefore, um, behind these different parts of this reinforcement learning map, there have been like a lot of methods, a lot of theorems, a lot of assumptions, uh, a lot of solutions which we have discussed. And in the exam, which will be oral exam, uh, you should be able to talk about that, right? So the examination will be basically that you are in the driver's seat and you need to explain, like, if we had the specific solution, how was that solution built up, what were the assumptions of the solutions, what are maybe drawbacks, advantages of certain solutions over others. So that's why you should be able to navigate through this, this map here and explain methods, assumptions, and concepts which we had obtained during the course. However, um, what we discussed so far is just uh, basically scratching the surface. There are many more topics which uh, we did not discuss so far. One of them is, for example, exploration, which is closely related to what Daniel presented today to safety, uh, where I can utilize pre-knowledge or model-based knowledge trying to not only make random exploration, which we discuss all the time, right? Epsilon greedy, so random actions which are then evaluated. And of course, if you're just taking random actions for explorations, I think you can imagine that many of these actions are somehow, you know, they don't make any sense. There may be a safety shield afterwards, which needs to kick them out. And even if there are safe actions, maybe they are not informative rich. So therefore, we can use pre-knowledge about systems in order to make exploration more useful and trying to ensure that we explore in such a way that um, we really learn something. So for example, if uh, you want to learn how to stabilize the pendulum, where you start from this lower position and you want to swing up the pe pendulum into the upper equilibrium point of view, for example, what you could do is you could try to come up with some model-based, expert-based trajectory how to do the swing up. It's maybe not the, the best swing up you can find because you maybe have not a perfect model. 
from this pendulum and maybe not a perfect model-based solution to this input directory, but it can be a good starting base from where you then do exploration. And of course, that will be more um, or will help you to learn how to stabilize this pendulum in contrast to that you start, the pendulum is hanging upside down and you just do random actions and it's just flipping around and not swinging up, right? So it will really take some time until it will then learn how to do that. By the way, we also have two pendulums in our lab, so if you're interested in stabilizing the pendulum, uh, just let us know. Um, imitation learning, that's basically also something which I've just uh, discussed a little bit. So how can we mimic the behavior of a certain baseline agent? Uh, that's also important, of course, with respect to safety. So consider the case that you might have a standard control algorithm where you know, okay, this is working decently, that is working safe, it's maybe not working optimally. But then we can try to map the behavior of this baseline agent, this baseline controller into our policy and then try to continue or start learning from this baseline such that we do not need to start from a completely randomly initialized policy where you just do, you know, very weird actions, but start from a policy which is at least decent and then try to find better policies from, from a good baseline. What else um, did we not discuss, but which is very interesting, are multi-agent algorithms. So um, definitely a huge field which you completely ignored due to, due to time and also complexity. Uh, but we had heard a little bit from Daniel about, for example, um, interconnected systems. So an energy grid, right? An energy grid is a system which is distributed over space, right? So you have maybe a generator sitting here, a load sitting here, a storage system like sitting here, and many, many of these entities uh, structured locally. And the question is, uh, what is the best solution in order to steer a complex interconnected system? Is it like one agent which has a, like access to all these different entities or are that maybe a bunch of agents which work together and every agent has just access to its own storage or source node and then there might be certain advantages or disadvantages between this centralized and decentralized approaches. So that's multi-agent systems. Very interesting. Uh, we did not consider them at all. Federated learning is then also highly connected with this topic of multi-agent uh, approaches, where um, learning to control a system could be also connected to data privacy things or data security things, that um, if you are the operator, for example, of uh, a solar power plant. So you are the owner of the power plant and you might want to contribute with your power plant to stabilizing the electricity grid. And there are maybe other owners of other power plants in your proximity. So there's maybe a guy which has a wind park with wind power plants. So you would need to somehow uh, discuss technically uh, with the other power plant owners in your areas how to operate your your set of different power plants such that you can stabilize the energy grid locally in your area without making a blackout. And the idea of federated learning is how can we exchange information between different agents such that we do not really need to exchange our, our classified information, like that you do not need to give up or give out your control policy to somebody else, right? So that could make you prone to, uh, for example, um, attacks uh, into your IT system from somebody else, but that you try to exchange this information, which is not as critical as, for example, exchanging your entire policies with others. So this is the idea of distributing learning between different agent, agents with only the local information. Also very interesting, also highly related to interconnected systems, like energy systems, for example. Um, and these are, from my point of view, the four interesting and most important subtopics which we did not discuss at all. If you're interested, for every topic, we have here like some recommended lecture, or not lectures, but research papers or overview papers, basically, 
So if you want to dig deeper into those different topics, please just start with these recommendations and from that you can, you know, use Google Scholar and so on and find more and more and more. So very interesting. So what you should have learned so far are uh, just a baseline summary. What are Markov decision processes, Markov, the Markov framework? We should be able to discuss about exact solutions in the tabular methods for discrete problem spaces. You should be able to find approximate solutions for large discrete or continuous problem spaces based on function approximation, so deep reinforcement learning. And you should be able to also apply these things on a technical, practical programming level because as you will just see in a very few minutes, the part of the examination will be a practical programming task. Um, as I've already mentioned, this is an introductory course, so we only scratch the surface of reinforcement learning and especially also connecting reinforcement learning with other techniques like control engineering. Uh, we uh, had a strong control focus, so if you hear or visit a reinforcement learning lecture, for example, by colleagues from uh, psychology or um, economic sciences or whatsoever, their concepts might look completely different. So they don't maybe care about safety because uh, in economics, for example, there is nothing like a technical system which can completely go, you know, through the roof if something happens. Um, so therefore, keep that in mind. We definitely had a control focus from an engineering point of view and that reinforcement learning can also have different notions depending on the application. And of course, uh, if you're interested into more practical insights, we have a normally ongoing project work and so on, where you're always cordially invited to contact us for projects, um, thesis work and so on, or also student helper work. Okay. Are there any questions regarding the summary of the entire course before we basically move to the homework assignment for the final exam? Okay, everyone fine so far? That's good. Then let's switch over to 